Thank you, May. It's a pleasure to be back in Reno. I left in 2005 and really haven't been back since. Um, so it's wonderful to be back after that amount of time. Um, so today, as May mentioned, I'm going to talk to you about something very different than what I did my dissertation on. That, and that tells you about the need to be flexible in your education. Um, and I'm going to talk about produced waters from shale reservoirs, basically. And produced waters simply are waters that are co-generated with hydrocarbons. And to give you an idea of what that might look like, these are five samples. These are all water samples from the Klein Shale and the Permian Basin of Texas. These, all, these wells all come within about a kilometer of each other, and you can see there's huge differences just in the way they look. This has a lot of sulfides in it. I don't know what's going on with that one. But that's what produced waters are. And, and my job at the USGS is I'm the chief of the project that looks at produced and ejected waters across the United States. Um, and that, that work is funded by the USGS Energy Resources Program. And there's a nice website, nice and short, uh, that has more information about the kind of work we do. And since I'm a project chief, I don't actually do any work myself. Uh, but there's a whole host of USGS scientists who actually do. And so a lot of the work I'm going to show you today is, is done by my colleagues. In particular, I'm going to focus on a nice paper that I wrote with Liz Rowan, uh, and uh, Tanya Gallegos has written some nice work as well. And um, I am located physically at the University of Texas at El Paso, and I've been lucky that I get to work with... Uh, faculty are nice, but I get to work with the graduate students as well, and that's much better. And so I've had two master's students that I've graduated there, Frankie Reyes and Stephanie Ray. And then I also get to work with folks at New Mexico State University, including two students, Naima Khan and Josue Magana, who have helped out with this research. So again, what is produced water? You know, I, was, I got hired at the survey, and they said, yeah, we'll hire you. I was doing atmospheric mercury work. And I said, but we want you to work on produced waters. I said, that's great. What are they? Uh, I had no idea. Um, so produced water simply is water that comes out of a hydrocarbon well after they've been drilled. And so that can be flow back. Flowback is the water that comes back after, right after you hydraulically fracture. So it's mainly the, the water you inject. There's also natural formation water that coexists with the hydrocarbons. So that's, that comes out. There's any sort of injected fluids. Um, so you could have water flooded in a well nearby. That would come back out as produced water. And then you can also get water condensing out of the gas phase. So any mixture of these uh, is considered a produced water. And so, in the, in the most general sense, the way most people think about them is that initially the water that comes out of a well is primarily the water that was injected for hydraulically fractured, for fracturing. And with time, you start producing some sort of formation water. That could have been water that was autochthonous to the unit you're in, or it could be water that flowed in from adjacent formations. And just to give you some basics about produced waters, um, the, the year that we have the most recent data for is 2012. And so the estimate is that we produced about 900 billion gallons of produced waters in the United States for that year. Um, the majority of it comes from states that produce hydrocarbons, not surprisingly. Uh, Texas, California, Oklahoma, Wyoming, and Kansas. And on average, for every barrel of oil you produce, you produce nine gallons of water. So we produce a lot more water than we do hydrocarbons. Now, shale's actually a little bit different. And shales often will produce far less than one gallon of one barrel of, of water per barrel of, of, of uh, oil. Uh, for, for natural gas, some natural gas wells are dry, but on average about 97 barrels of water per million cubic feet of gas. Uh, in terms of disposal, the vast majority of it is injected either for water flooding or just into a, into a disposal well. Uh, there are some commercial treatment plants. This has become more popular, particularly in places like Pennsylvania, where they generate a lot of produced water, but they don't have a good place to put it. And surface discharge, uh, because there are some produced waters, particularly from coal bed methane plays, that are even potable, basically. So you can dispose of them in the surface. Uh, in terms of their constituents, what do they contain? Uh, generally, they're very saline. So a good metric to think about is that seawater, bulk seawater, is about 35 grams per liter. Produced waters can be in excess of four or 500 grams per liter of salinity. By and large, the only major ions are sodium, calcium, and chloride. So we sort of, that's sort of a given. That's not really true for some of the cold bed methane waters, but we'll slide with that. They can contain high concentrations of organics, 
If they do, it's typically uh, anions of fatty acids and alkanes. Any sort of trace element you name is in there. Uh, they tend to be radioactive. Primarily, it'd be radium that's in there. Uh, contain oil and grease, bacteria, and microbes. So in other words, don't drink it. Um, and so I think as probably everybody here is aware, oil and gas production in the United States have greatly increased in the last 15 years. 30% increase in natural gas production. And sort of, if you look at the EIA numbers, EIA thinks that basically any day now, the US will become a net ex exporter of natural gas. So here are EIA estimates of trillion cubic feet of gas production over time. And so the stuff to the right of this number, those are projections. But if you look over here, this is hard data. And we can see that total gas production has gone up. And most of that growth has been in tight gas, which is a low permeability sand, or in shale. And there's actually been a decrease in the conventional, here in the red and blue, the conventional gas sources. Oil production. U.S. oil has increased in production 50%, more or less, in the last 15 years. And the U.S. produces more oil than any other country in the world. I bet most of you probably didn't know that. We overtook Saudi Arabia. Uh, and so here's a, a classic diagram of oil production versus time. And this is what was termed peak oil. And there's this big increase starting in about 2005. And so we can see all this new production is coming from low permeability reservoirs like tight sandstones and shales. Well, I realize this is UNR. This is not a petroleum school. So I'm going to teach you a little bit about petroleum accumulations. The way hydrocarbons are generated is you take a source rock. A source rock is just a, a rock that has a lot of organic carbon in it. And you bury it, and it goes through maturation. And originally, it, initially, it'll produce oil, then condensates, then gas, and then it'll be overly mature. So anything produced out of it, those hydrocarbons are rather buoyant. And so they're going to tend to migrate some of them out of the source rock. And, and so you can imagine if there's some sort of geologic seal, which is the geologist version of an aquitard, uh, those hydrocarbons are going to accumulate in very discrete areas. Uh, and that, that is a conventional hydrocarbon accumulation. That's where most of oil and gas over the last 100 years in the United States has come from. So they're very discrete in nature. They're not very well spread out. But basically, if you can find them, you put a well down, and it'll start producing. But what we've switched to are what we call continuous hydrocarbon accumulations. So the shale that produces those hydrocarbons still has hydrocarbons in it. And it's not discrete. It's spread out across the entire basin. And so basically, anywhere that you put down a well, if the organic carbon content is high enough, if the thermal maturation is high enough, it'll produce hydrocarbons. So that's what we're generating. This is what we're going after now. You also have things like tight sands. This is a tight sand where gas has come out of the black shale, but it's held into the sand uh, by capillary pressures. And so if you just, it's low permeability, if you frack it, you'll get hydrocarbons out of it. So that's what has really happened. And the reason we've been, we, I use that as a royal we, obviously, I don't do any of this. But the reason we can do this now is due to two main technologies. The first of which is horizontal drilling. So for instance, the Eagleford Shale in South Texas is one of the most productive oil and gas plays in the United States. But it's only about 20 feet thick. So if you put a vertical well in it, you can only drain a section that's about 20 feet thick. But if you can turn that well horizontally and go out into that unit for a mile or two, now you're draining a mile or two. So it becomes much more economic. The other thing that has been done, uh, and I'm sure everyone's heard about fracking. So hydraulic fracturing has been around since the 1940s. But early hydraulic fracturing was using TNT, where they were rubbleizing the formation. Um, and then they went to gel fracks and foam fracks and other kinds of things. But the big thing with shales is something called a slick water frack, where they use a friction reducer, like a polyacrylamide. And, and that has allowed them to, to fracture shales pretty well. So they'll inject pretty high volumes of water per well. They put in some additives, like, a, uh, like I said, a friction reducer, um, some surfactants, uh, uh, an anti scalant And they'll put in propent. Propent is the term for the material that props open the fractures. That's why they call it prop, and it's normally sand or ceramic. And I'm not going to get into the details of exactly how this happens, but they basically put the fluid in under pressure, 
it, it fractures the reservoir, and the propellant moves out into the reservoir. And they let it sit for a period of time, which is called marinating. And uh, after, the, after the reservoir is marinated, they'll open the well up, and the water starts to come back, some of it, uh, and then the well will go into production. So that's basically how shale gas and tight oil wells are developed. Now, there's been a lot of discussion that maybe some of the folks on the environmental side say, man, this is really different than what we've done before. But the oil and gas industry says, no, no, no. We've been doing hydraulic fracturing since the 1940s. This is really no different than what we've been doing for a very long time. So one way to think about that is how big a scale are we working on? And so um, this is a report that was put out by my colleague Tanya, uh, where she looked through a, a large proprietary database at the number of hydraulic fracturing records, meaning how many stimulations they had done, per year from 1947 until 2010. And so uh, that thick gray line, we can see that starting in about 2000, there's a big increase in the number of wells that are being hydraulically fractured. There's a big drop here in 2008. That's because the price of oil dro uh, gas dropped. But it started to come back with oil. OK, well, there's more treatments. Does that really mean more impact? Uh, another way you could look at this is how much water is being used, how much water is being consumed for hydraulic fracturing. And so this is from uh, Tanya's paper in WRR. Uh, that she was nice. She put my paper on it because I'm the project chief. But uh, so from, she looked at the period of 20, 2000 to 2014 and said, OK, for different kinds of wells, uh, basically a, a vertical well is considered to be a conventional well, and a horizontal well is considered to be uh, uh, a continuous resource, and I won't explain directional. But what you see is that there are two classes where the amount of water for the median amount of water per well just really takes off, and that's the amount of water for shale gas and tide oil development. So at least from a, a, an intensity issue, there is something different about it. Okay, well, I study, and because I'm paid to, the chemistry of produced waters. Well, we, we've been looking at chemistry of produced waters for over 100 years. So do we really have what we need? So this is a beautiful map of TDS from the USGS Produced Waters Database, which is a database that, the, that our project generates. So um, wow, that's, that's a lot of data. Basically, every major oil and gas producing basin in the US we have data for. Let's focus on where, where the big the most important players are. Because they have these maps with 100 shale units on it. And you're like, well, that's fine, but which ones are important? So I, I want you to basically know three or two. The most productive shale gas producing play in the United States is right here. It's in the Appalachian Basin that's called the Marcellus Shale. And I'm going to show you a lot of data from the Marcellus Shale. Uh, and you can see, wow, there's a lot of data points out here. The number one tight oil producing play is here in the Permian Basin. OK, a lot of data there. And both from number two for production for shale gas and tide oil is the Eagleford Shale in South Texas. A lot of data down there. Looks like we're pretty good. Maybe we don't need to collect any new data. But when we look at well types, and when we take the same data and say, OK, what kind of wells are these? The white circles you see everywhere are conventional oil and gas wells. So in the Permian Basin, we have no data. We have no idea what the water coming out of the shales looks like. Up here in the Appalachian Basin, we can see some orange dots. And that's shale gas. Um, but this is the most recent version of the database that came out a month ago. Five years ago, there were no dots here. We just didn't know. So can you use these data from maybe carbonate and sandstone reservoirs to infer what the chemistry from the shale is? Maybe. We just didn't know. And then down here in Eagleford Shale, nothing. So today, I'm probably primarily going to talk about data from the, the Marcella Shale in the Appalachian Basin and from the Wolf Camp and Klein Shale in the Permian Basin, because they're the two most important basins in the US. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rewind the clock to kind of where we were in 2009 with our understanding of the system. And so this is primarily taken from a paper written by some folks in industry from the Society of Petroleum Engineering. And they were looking at time series of produced waters coming out of shale gas wells in the Marcella Shale. So the first thing they noticed was that more than half of the water that they injected into the reservoir never came back out. And the petrophysicists told them, there's no water. This unit's totally dry. And they said, OK, well, shales are known to imbibe water. 
So the, the shales are just sucking that water up. You put the water in, some of the water comes back out. But the TDS in the water tended to increase in time. And it would go up to maybe 100 grams per liter. They also noticed that sulfate dropped. So this is a plot from their paper of, this is volume of flowback. So again, flowback is that water that comes out right after you frack it. So in the first couple of weeks. So volume of flowback uh, versus chloride. So chloride starts at 1,000 milligrams per liter, goes up to almost 70,000 milligrams per liter. Sulfate drops off. And they said, well, the sulfate drops off because it makes... Um, Sorry, uh, it makes uh, like baryte or something like that. It's just scale. Uh, and, okay, well, again, this unit's dry, so the only source for this salinity is from dissolving uh, something in the rocks. And they, they show this picture in their, um, in their paper, and there's a nice picture of the, the Marcella shale, and there's bedded halite. Uh, and I don't know you about you, but uh, I don't know of an environment where you get black shale and halite together. It seemed much more likely that they brought that up and there was water in there that was very saline and the water precipitated and made halite. But that's, that's kind of where we were. This was the model that industry had put forth what they thought under what was going on. So with that in mind, we developed a variety of research tasks. And um, to be honest, there's, we've already probably put out about 10 or 12 papers on these topics and I can't cover all of them. Um, but we, First, you know, let's just look at the chemistry of water from shales. We looked at the inorganics, the organics, the isotopes, and the radionuclides. And today, I'm mainly just going to talk about the inorganics and the isotopes, because that's what I find interesting, I'll be honest. Uh, OK, let's look at the origin of the waters from the shales. Is that the same water that you find in the, in the carbonates and the sandstones around it? And then, if you have a spill at the surface, it'd be really nice to tell, is that from a shale gas reservoir? Is that from a, uh, an old spill from the 1970s? So trying to develop some geochemical fingerprinting methods. And again, uh, we're nationally congress uh, a congressionally funded program, and so we always have to justify where we do work. So focusing on the most important plays, considering production, history of development, regulation, population centers, and relative risk. Um, but again, for right now, I'm just going to focus on the two most productive plays. And so we started by looking at radium. There was a lot of concern in Pennsylvania in particular. Uh, oil, oil and gas development, particularly their shale gas development, was just going really, really fast. And people had heard were worried about radium in the produced water. So we uh, went out and compiled data from a variety of places. And we actually had a few of our own data. So 91 samples from conventional reservoirs, 52 samples from the Marcella Shale, produced waters. And we looked at two of the four radium isotopes. Radium-228 and radium-226. 228 is part of the thorium decay chain, and 226 is part of the uranium-238 decay chain. So if you ratio them, they're a proxy for the thorium to uranium content. Uh, and the reason, too, you look at radium is most of the other things in the decay chain are not terribly soluble. So you're not going to get any thorium, or you, know, you shouldn't get much uranium. There's very little in the produced waters but radium is quite soluble. So that's why we look for that. And so uh, we, we took our data set and we said, OK, first of all, there's a pretty big range in the concentrations. So this is a log scale of total radium, 228 plus 226. And you can see we have data that range from one picocuries per liter to over 20,000 picocuries per liter. Well, that doesn't, you know, that doesn't tell you a whole lot. So we noticed that there was a relationship with salinity. So this is log of TDS versus log of total radium here. And we broke out the data from the Marcella Shale in the red versus the conventional reservoirs in blue. And what we found, I ran an analysis of covariance, and that told me that, yes, there is an increase. But for any given salinity, the amount of radium in the produced water from the Marcella Shale is maybe three to five times higher than you would get out of a conventional reservoir. And that makes geologic sense because the black shale has uranium in it. Uranium decays, makes radium-226. Uh, so we know that the Marcella shale waters have more radium in them. The other thing is we can look at the ratio of 228 to 226 for the different reservoirs. So this is different stratigraphic ages. And here's the Marcella shale. It's middle Devonian. And there's a few dots over here. That's early flowback. But except for those few early flowback, that ratio is always under 0.3, which is what you'd expect because 
shales, uh, black shales, have little thorium and a lot of uranium. Conversely, sandstones, which are all the green dots all over the place, so different ages, of, they're always greater than one because sandstones have a lot of thorium and not very much uranium. Oh, okay. So it looks like we may actually have a discrimination tool here just based on radium isotopes. Um, not that radium is terribly conservative, but carbonates are sort of a little more variable. Uh, and so that led us to wonder, okay, well, you know, is that radium? Uh, we, we knew, because you don't actually measure radium, you measure the daughter products, and they were in secular equilibrium, which means that water had been, that radium had been in that water for at least 30 years. So we're, we thought we're getting a pretty good signal uh, of, of the native water, not water coming in from adjacent formations. But we went back to the original model that the oil and gas folks uh, made that said, you know, we're just putting water in and some of it comes out. So we looked at oxygen and hydrogen isotopes in a time series of wells of the Marcella Shale in a couple different parts of the play. But here's the local, sorry, the global meteoric water line. This is local meteoric water. These open symbols circled here, more or less, that was the, the composition of the water that was injected for hydraulic fracturing into these wells. And this is the composition of the water that came out of those wells. So we can see there's a pretty clear shift in the oxygen-18 content, but about the, there's not really a shift in the deuterium content. So um, if we take a look at these data over here, this is time series uh, versus just oxygen-18. And we can see that here's the water we inject, here's day one of flow back, and so on, all the way out to a couple of years. And within one day, the water that's injected, the oxygen isotopes have shifted over more than one per mil. Now, certainly, you can get oxygen exchange with carbonate minerals and things like that, but not in one day. There's a different source of water down there. And after about three months, you hit the stable composition of that water, which we think is some kind of formation water. It's some other water that was down there before we hydraulically fractured. Hmm. Okay, so now we're really getting somewhere. So then the question was, is that water that we're finding, water that was within the Marcellus, or is that water coming in from adjacent reservoirs? And so my colleague Liz looked at the radium isotopes a little bit and thought about it and said, well, there's something funny going on that I think helps us answer this. And so this is one of these wells that we have a time series of, of radium. So this is radium-226 here, 228 over time. And Liz noted that on day eight, there's a deviation in the radium-226. It actually goes up in 228. The ratio changes. And it lasts for a few days and then snaps back. So if, if water were just coming in and picking up the radium off of the rocks, it should all have the same signature throughout time. But because you see these deviations that last for a few days, it suggests that there's not this really rapid exchanging of radium. And in fact, that this is a little pocket of sand that flowed in to the Marcellus, but basically all the rest of this water is a toxinous water that was in the Marcellus shale. So now we have, a, we have a paradox. We've got a well that we put millions of gallons of water into, and it's a formation that's supposedly dry. So if there's any water in the way, it should have just kind of pushed it out of the way. You lose most of that water, and then the water that comes back out is brine. It's a formation water. That doesn't make a lot of sense. And so we spent a lot of time talking to reservoir engineers and petrophysicists because multiphase fluid flow inside of a, I mean, I don't remember the class here at UNR and multiphase fluid flow inside of oil and gas reservoirs. Um, and so, you know, you have to go talk to people who know about this. And so the model that we came up with, particularly with working with Alan Burns at Chesapeake, was the idea that if you have a little block of rock that has been fractured, you can imagine two points. So one close to the fracture will be more saturated than the point further away. So you've got a gradient in, in the amount of water. And if you look at capillary, uh, this is a curve for two different permeability formations showing capillary entry pressures. 
And so the blue curve is for higher permeability materials. The red curve is for lower permeability materials. And so if you plot points A and B at a high permeability material, that gradient, pressure gradient, is about 1,700 PSI. At lower permeability, it's about 5,500 PSI. And so what Alan tried to convince us of, and, and I'm not a petrophysicist, but it seems somewhat reasonable, is that when the well goes in the, is this hydraulically fractured and it's under a lot of positive pressure, it's gonna push water out here, make some nice gradients, and some water will get imbibed, particularly in the low permeability areas. But then the well goes in production. And once the well goes in production, this gradient basically goes to zero and there's very little capillary reasoning that water would want to come back out of the shales. And then you have viscous forces allowing water coming out of the high permeability areas where some of the brine is. So that's sort of our conceptual model. I won't say it's right, um, but it at least is one way to think about it. There's probably quite a bit of diffusion going on as well. Okay, well, we've got this late stage formation water. What is it? Where did it come from? And so we wanted to look at the origin of this water. And one of the easiest, simplest ways to do that is look at the, the systematics for sodium chloride and bromide. And that's because when you take seawater and you evaporate it to the point of making halite, halite doesn't like to go into bromide. So here's sodium bromide versus chloride bromide. Here's halite, uh, sorry, seawater. If you evaporate it, it goes this way. Well, lo and behold, here's all of our data. So it looks like it's old paleo evaporated seawater. It's old seawater. Uh, it's pretty far down. And based on some of the oxygen hydrogen isotopes, my colleague Liz thought that this had been evaporated or it, the solutes had been increased in concentration by about 36 fold. Um, but the other thing she noticed is if you look at the major ions, it doesn't really match with that. So as I mentioned, produced waters, chloride is really the only major anion, so I'm not even going to show you anything about chloride. But here's magnesium, calcium, sodium, potassium. So here's the composition of seawater. This is a, the composition of seawater at the point of halite saturation. And this is the composition that she thinks it got to. Well, here are the samples from north central Pennsylvania and samples from southwestern Pennsylvania. There's a, there's a pretty big mismatch here. And so the other thing is these samples have a salinity of 160 grams per liter. These are 280 grams per liter. Uh, according to modeling, this water would actually be more saline than either. So A, we think there's some meteoric mixing. And that would sort of explain where things are with oxygen hydrogen isotopes, which I won't bore you with. But to get from here to here requires some reaction that produces magnesium and sucks up mag. And dolatization is one of those important reactions. So that's these two processes after the seawater formed were involved in it. But there's differences on depending on what part of the state you're in. So in conclusion, about the Marcellus Shale, okay, if you inject fracturing fluid, it mixes with formation brine, and some of the water you inject is lost in the vision. And it starts producing formation water from within the Marcellus after about 90 days. I didn't talk about this, but there's also, we think, evidence of sulfate reduction. Because you put water in that has sulfate, and there are sulfate-reducing bacteria that have been observed by some of my colleagues at the survey, and this would really affect strontium and, borum, uh, strontium and barium. This formation water, we think, is ancient evaporated seawater. Uh, most people think it's silurian in age because there's the salina, the silurian salina salts, but it could also be Permian. Um, there was some mixing with meteoric water and it impacts from diagenetic reactions like daltonization. So at, at the end of that work, we sort of understood that, okay, if we want to understand the origin of brines, we don't really want to study, well, that's a, anyway, uh, we don't really want to understand, we don't want to look at the first part of the flow back. We want to look at wells that have been production for a few months. So we went to go look at the Permian Basin. Uh, the Permian Basin is located this is southeastern New Mexico into beautiful West Texas. There's no topography out here to speak of other than Guadalupe Peak. Um, and there are several shales that are produced from out here. And the most important thing to sort of point out about this basin is it has two sub-basins, one to the west and one to the east. 
And even though there have been hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of papers about the geology of the Permian Basin, there are fewer than 10 papers about the brines. And almost all of them have been done up here, near the Waste Isolation Project Plant, and sort of going into the Paladero Basin because they thought about putting nuclear waste there. But this is where most of the oil production occurs. So there have been very few studies uh, to help understand what the origin and the chemistry of those waters are. The other thing, this is a cross-section from west to east, this green color, this is a very thick evaporite sequence. And hydrite, halite, polyhalite, sylvite, kind of the, the gamut. Um, and so this is kind of a regional seal. Uh, so we focused sampling in over here, and I collected about 40 samples, and I analyzed them for ions, oxygen, hydrogen, strontium, and boron isotopes. And there was one study right, right here from Stuber in 98, 32 samples, all the same isotopes except for boron, because boron's a pain to analyze, and I don't know why I ever agreed to do it in the first place. And then in here, there was another 1,400 samples from the USGS Produced Waters database. So that's, that's where we started with. And so the first thing I did was, well, let's, now, now we've got quite a bit of data uh, from different shales. Let's, let's just do some simple comparisons, some univariate analyses. And I don't want really high, really low numbers, so just 75th and 25th percentiles. So here's Wolf Camp and the Klein Shale. Those are the two from the Permian. And the Klein is the deeper of the two. So keep that in mind. The Bakken from North Dakota and the Marcellus from Pennsylvania. So TDS is a little bit lower in the Permian Basin samples and much lower in the Klein, the deeper one. That's kind of strange. Normally salinity increases with depth. They're all what we call calcium chloride type brines. pH is circumneutral. It's a little higher out here, but I won't. That's, a, that's an analytical issue. Um, the Marcellus has a lot of radi uh, barium in it. Really no barium to speak of. Not a whole lot of radium, but a lot of iodine, particularly in the Klein. That's kind of interesting. All right. Never, ever, ever show a figure like this at a presentation. Uh, so. Um, I'll get to this in a second. The other thing that we were learning as we were doing data analysis is there's kind of an issue with plotting element X versus element Y with brines. And I'll, I'll talk about why in a second. So we started using some different ways to, to analyze the data. And so what I did is I took all of the, the rocks that are Wolf Campion in age. So Wolf Campion is lower Permian. I took all the wells and split them into whether they were shales or not. And then from that, I figured out of the salinity, how much of the salinity by mass is different things. So on average, 61% of the salinity is chloride, 32% sodium, et cetera. And so I did that for the, Wolf, for the Wolf Camp shale, as well as the carbonates that surround it. And then I ratioed the two, uh, with the shale being on top, so that we see the relative abundance of boron is the same, basically, between the shales and the non-shales. And that's true for chloride, bromide, potassium, and boron. However, the shales are relatively enriched in lithium, uh, oh, nickel, sodium, sorry, lithium and sodium, and depleted in calcium and magnesium. Hmm. Uh, I did the same thing for the Klein shale. It's Pennsylvanian, so I used Pennsylvanian reservoirs. And again, chloride is conservative, potassium is relatively conservative, Depletion in calcium magnesium, large enrichments in bromide, boron, lithium, and sodium. So there's something fundamentally different around these waters that are in the, in the shales. And this gets us to a little math lesson, which I know on Friday night you guys have got to be super excited about. But the whole time in the back of my head, it really bothered me. Concentration data are all relative parts. It doesn't matter if it's in milligrams per kilograms or milligrams per liter. As you increase the concentration of any one parameter, it decreases the concentration of everything else. We've known about this problem in petrology and soil geochemistry for a very long time. Well, guess what? How much does the water content change in a water sample that goes from 10 grams per liter to 200 grams per liter? A lot. And when that happens, it causes spurious correlations. It causes weird things with your variables. And so we were teaching ourselves a form of mathematics to fix this problem. It's called compositional data analysis. And a lot of my colleagues, they sort of let me publish papers, but they thought it was just strange, and they didn't really understand how it mattered. So I'm going to show you an example uh, from...
on this data set because it's one of the best examples of why it matters. So we're going to look at that sodium chloride bromide system again for the Permian Basin. So here's a concentration versus concentration plot like we we're all taught to make. Here's the, this is the estimated composition of late Permian seawater. If you dissolve, the, uh, sorry, if you evaporate that up, it increases together until halite precipitates. And then chloride gets sucked up, bromide doesn't, and it goes that way. If you take seawater and dissolve halite, which has no bromide in it, it just goes basically straight up. And I plotted all of my data on there. And I know that's a terrible plot. Again, if you're taking seminar, this is a great example of not what to do because there's too many words and the plot's too small. But I want you to take, so uh, there's all these reservoirs, but they're in order. So here are the Guadalupian rocks and the Leonardian rocks. So these are the top of the Paleozoic sequence right under the salt. And these sit right here along this line, which is what you would get if you dissolve halite. Okay, that makes sense. You're right underneath that salt. Then we're going to lump everything else together that's not a shale. So Wolf Campion, Pennsylvanian, Devonian, Silurian, and basically they plot along here. So they look like they're evaporated seawater, but not, not to the point of halite saturation. Then we're going to look at the shales, because the shales are what I really care about. Here's the Klein Shale down here. I don't know. It's just kind of off in left field. And then, wow, this is really suggestive. These are the Wolf Camp shale samples, and they sit on this nice line. And so I was taught, if you see that line, that means it's a mixture between really evaporated water and basically not evaporated water. So that's how you would interpret that. The problem with that is that this water, this water, and this water all has the same oxygen-hydrogen isotopes. So a mixing model like this, the fact that it would have the exact same composition seems very unlikely. Is this a spurious correlation? So some people will try to fix this by ratioing things. And so it's not uncommon. This is a, a, the plot was developed uh, in 1990 to just ratio sodium chloride by bromide. Now, history lesson, in 1897, Carl Pearson, the guy who invented correlation coefficients, wrote a paper about this exact same topic and said, if you do this, uh, you will get spurious correlations. This is the exact definition of where spurious correlations comes from. So uh, in this type of situation, like Permian seawater, let's dissolve halite. It goes this way. If you take seawater and it gets past halite saturation, it goes this way. OK, the green samples, which are the shallow ones, sit over here. Well, that's good. The rest of the samples sit near Permian seawater, which they should. But let's look at those shales. The Klein shale, which kind of plotted off in left field and left plot, sits way out here. So this plot suggests that it's super, super, super evaporated water, except this is the lower, lowest salinity water in the entire stratigraphic section. Doesn't make any sense. This is the Wolf Camp waters, and they look like, hey, this looks like a mixture between highly evaporated Klein and not evaporated water. But this has a lower salinity than this does. Something's, something's funny. So instead, we use this crazy form of mathematics, and we convert the data to something called an isometric log ratio. And these look crazy, but, but I can simplify this pretty well. We're just looking at a sodium chloride ratio. All right, we can handle that. So if you dissolve halite, this ratio should approach 1. And since you're taking a log of it, it's 0. So this should approach 0 if you're evaporating seawater. If you're, uh, sorry, if seawater is dissolving halite, it should approach 1, and it does. And if you take seawater and evaporate it, that ratio goes down. This other term is a little funkier, but just think about it as a partitioning coefficient between bromide and sodium chloride. So if you dissolve halite, it goes to the right. Uh, if you take seawater and evaporate it, so bromide builds up, it goes to the left. OK, that's cool. Let's look at where our data plot. The green samples still plot along halite dissolution. OK, so now three plots have told us that's true. Uh, again, on this plot, to plot down here, you have to be past halite saturation. So most of the other data plot right around late Permian seawater. That agrees with the other plots. But look at the shales. The shales are in a very different place. And on this kind of plot, if you mix water from, say, here versus here, it's actually a mixture along this line. 
What this plot tells us is that we've had an addition of external bromide. And that, that screwed up the version where we divided by bromide, and it pushed the Klein off uh, from, the, from the first plot. Also, there's been something that's caused sodium to increase. And remember when we looked at the centers, the shales have an excess of sodium from something. And the only way we could tell this is by using this crazy form of mathematics. Okay, so we got excess bromide and iodine. That's often tied to like a, a marine, marine carrageen. And so we could look at boron isotopes to tell us whether that we think that's true. So uh, for reasons I won't belabor, it's usually not necessary to convert isotopic data into log ratios, but here's the old boron chloride ratio as, a, as an isometric log ratio. Late Permian seawater evaporation. So we got it there. Wolf Camp, Leonardian rocks, they, they basically look like evaporated late Permian seawater. Look at this. Here's the Klein shale. Uh, it's isotopically lighter, and there's an enrichment in boron. And that is consistent with uh, laboratory work and work from the Gulf Coast Basin suggesting that also boron is being added. Uh, so this carrageen in the source rock is breaking down and producing bromide, iodide, boron, and it messes up your sodium chloride bromide systematics. The other thing we see is that the Silurian rocks that are the deepest rocks have a very unusual signature. This is a histogram of TDS for the different reservoirs from top to bottom. Okay, so the salts sit right up here. So Guadalupian, and we see that in general, TDS increases with depth down to the Devonian, which is bimodal. And if you sort of accept that perhaps this is connected, then there's some low TDS zone here. It's kind of strange. The other thing we note, here's the Wolf Camp Shale versus Wolf Campian Reservoir. So it does have a lower salinity, and the Klein Shale samples have a much lower salinity than carbonates of the same age. So they are the lowest salinity samples uh, so they're definitely not highly, highly evaporated. But this suggested to us, maybe this is a different water-bearing unit. So we look at oxygen-hydrogen isotopes, which I've alluded to a lot. This is the local meteoric water line for the area that was actually developed by my master's student, Frankie Reyes. So the little green dots, top of the, the reservoir, uh, we think that those got their salinity from dissolving halite, and they're meteoric. That fits pretty well. The deepest reservoirs, Devonian and Silurian, that I have these data for, also suggest it's meteoric. So you have meteoric water at the top and meteoric water on the bottom with 10,000 feet of very old seawater in the middle. So this is the composition of seawater. If you evaporate it, it follows a hook trajectory like this. And so there are four samples down here. I'm not going to explain what's up with them. It's in the paper and it's not very interesting. But most of our data plot right here. This, is, this represents about a 10,000 foot thick section of reservoirs. They all have the, pretty much the same ratio, uh, and there's a little orange colored circle here. That's the composition of fluid inclusions in primary evaporite minerals and halite in the basin just north of it. It has the exact same composition. So maybe this really is the water that formed those evaporites, but there's a sort of funny little shift off to the right. And you can explain that very simply by uh, temperature-dependent oxygen exchange with, uh, with, with carbonate minerals of Pennsylvanian and Permian age. And, and there's a very nice figure in the paper if you want to read it. So, um, so oh, okay, so this is, but there's definitely something interesting going on very deep in the basin. The last thing we want to look is, is strontium isotopes. And this is uh, a plot, just look at the left-hand side for a moment. And so this is 1 over strontium concentration versus strontium 8786. And so in this type of plot, uh, mixing is a straight line. And so I've left a mixing trend in here from Stuber in 98 that I don't think exists. Um, so again, we'll go back to our green dots at the very top of the reservoir. They have the same composition of late Permian seawater. But you say, Mark, you just told me this is not seawater. It's, it's meteoric water. Well, the anhydrite, so these are dot plots of different mineral sources within the basin. And so we can see that they have the same signature as the anhydrite in the evaporites. So that's where that strontium came from. Conversely, these rocks in the Devonian and the Silurian down at the very bottom of the basin have a very different signature. 
This is not, I don't think, water that has somehow gotten around 10,000 feet of seawater. This is very old meteoric water down at the bottom of the basin that's never been identified. But the vast majority of our data sit right here. There's no real mixing seen between anything, but they have a pretty narrow range of strontium 8786 ratios. And it's not the same as late Permian seawater. That's kind of strange. I, I, I said that this is late Permian seawater that formed halite. Why doesn't it have the same ratio? And so luckily, someone, poor master's student, had done a rubinium strontium isochron on halite and polyhalite evaporite minerals at the top of the sequence. And because these are rocks that have rubidium in them, they're 87, 86 changes with time. And so I had to use the isochron to figure out what they were when these formed during the late Permian, and that's these dots, which is the same value. So this almost definitely is the same water that formed the halite. And the reason it doesn't have the same signature as seawater from that time period is because of all these detrital clays that came on into this very restricted basin. So you can imagine it's a very closed, restricted basin, and all this dust starts depositing. There's some river water bringing in clays, and that's why it has a different signature. So there is one little paradox here. We now have water in the shales that has the same oxygen, hydrogen, strontium isotopes as the water in the carbonate reservoirs, but it has much lower salinity, and the ions are different. So the conventional model that's used to explain this is that water is released during clay diagenesis, and that causes the lower salinity. But if that happens, potassium is lost and boron is lost, and neither one of those things happen. The shales are not depleted in either one of those. Also, the Klein, which has the lowest salinity, has no significant clay diagenesis that occurred in it because it was potassium poor. So we needed to come up with a new model that works. This is what I proposed in the paper. It may or may not be right. But the idea is you form this very dense seawater that starts sinking down into the basin, and it moves around the basin margins to get around the clays, and there's probably some old seawater in those clays, and it starts to diffuse into those clays, but not at high pressure. And so, um, you know, lithium and sodium would diffuse much faster than calcium and magnesium. Boron-11 would diffuse a little bit faster than boron-10, which is why the wolf camp is a little bit heavier. So this is sort of the model we, we threw forward. It's probably wrong, but it was better than nothing. So in conclusion, on the Permian Basin, we now understand the produced waters, the late stage produced waters, are basically old Permian seawater that formed the halide at the top of the sequence. And the water that's in the shales is fundamentally different than the water in the carbonates. It has lower salinity, and it was affected by release of compounds from the carrageen, as well as possibly diffusion. And we also identified a new meteoric water system at the very bottom of the basin. Uh, and that's not super surprising. Rocks of equivalent age outcrop in El Paso, I could run by them all the time, and they're very karsted. Uh, and we also think that there's an influx of shallow meteoric water through the halite starting Cretaceous. So there's downward net water movement into the basin. So just some final thoughts. Uh, now that we've kind of covered a couple of things, there's origin of water from shales varies within and across plays. But you can't necessarily use all of the thousands of data points we have from carbonates and sands to estimate what the source of that water is. Uh, it's temporally variable, so early flowback is going to look different than late flowback. If you get into other wells, at the, at the end you can actually get water condensing out of the gas phase as the salinity goes back down. And isotopic fingerprinting is a mixed bag. So I showed you in the Permian Basin, 10,000 feet thick water, conventional reservoirs, unconventional reservoirs, they all have the same oxygen, hydrogen, strontium isotopes. If you get a spill at the surface, I can't tell you what's what. You might be able to do it with ions, but isotopically it's not very happy. But if you look in the Appalachian Basin, this is a nice paper written by Liz Chapman in 2012, strontium 87, 86 values for different units through there. And the Marcellus has a very particular 87, 86 signature and has a ton of strontium, so it's pretty easy to pick up. So with that, I think I've talked for enough, so I can answer any questions. Thank you very much.